Hi, my name is Rachel Harvey, and I'm the Associate Executive Director of the Reconciling Ministries Network. I'm a lifelong United Methodist. I was born into a United Methodist Church of 30 people, and I'm related to all but three of them. I've also always worked in the United Methodist Connection. Um, there was one day in high school where I worked at a grocery store, and it wasn't a good experience, so I decided the next day that I wasn't going to go back. But I did always work at Gretna Glen United Methodist Camp and worked there for four years and had an amazing time. Um, and then I decided that I would take another summer off and work at the Water Street Rescue Mission in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I had an amazing time and promised all of my fifth and sixth grade girls that I would come back the next year and be their counselor again. The next summer, I was hired to be the lead counselor, and so I was really excited and had even decided as a social work major that for the rest of my life, I was going to work at Water Street and that I was going to put down roots in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And then I got a call from my supervisor, Jamie, and he had some questions about my application. Um, after working there for a year, he wanted to know what SAIL stood for. And I explained that SAIL was students advocating LGBTA equality on the Shippensburg University campus. And then he said, well, Rachel, what does LGBTA stand for? And, and so I said, well, it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and allies. And then he said, well, where do you fit into that picture? Are you a lesbian? And so when I explained to him what it means to be a straight ally, he just sort of wasn't sure what to do with me. Um, because if I was lesbian or bisexual or transgender, then they had explicitly named in their policy that I would not have been able to work there. But as a straight woman, there were, no, there were no policies barring my employment, um, but theologically I just wasn't online with where he was. And so after an hour-long phone conversation, Jamie decided we needed to meet in person. And so for about three hours, we discussed where we stood on the Bible and other things, and even watched a movie about a man who's been delivered from his homosexuality and goes around delivering other people. And at the end of that conversation, I said to Jamie, well, where does this leave my employment, remembering the promise that I had made to my girls? And he said, well, Rachel, a little yeast spoils the whole batch, and you won't be able to work here at Water Street. And I was just devastated. Um, I didn't know what to do. My entire life plan had all been taken away from me. And so I went back to Gretna Glen, the United Methodist camp that I had worked at, and I went in and told my boss, and I said, you know, this is what I believe, and this is what just happened to me in Lancaster, and, and even if I work here, I will remain a woman of integrity, and I will continue to speak up about issues that I'm passionate about and the people that I care about. And, and my boss said, well, Rachel, the United Methodist Church is a place of open hearts and open doors and open minds, and so, of course, we welcome your diverse perspective on our camp staff. Um, and then I moved to South Dakota and realized that that wasn't the experience that everyone had. Um, that the open doors that have been extended to me by my camp were not available to everyone. Um, it was my third year as the campus minister at the University of South Dakota and one of my students, Lewis, had just recently joined the United Methodist Church and he was very excited about his first annual conference. So we went and stood by our campus ministry table and shared um, t-shirts and information about our campus ministry and Lewis told everyone there about his conversion from the Lutheran Church to the Methodist Church and, and how proud he was to be a United Methodist and to be involved in our campus ministry. And then on the third day, the annual conference was voting on some LGBT legislation. And I sat in the back with Lewis because I wasn't clergy and I wasn't the lay delegate from our church. So I wasn't allowed to cross the bar of the annual conference. I wasn't allowed to go past that imaginary line that exists. And so I was sitting with Lewis and I looked at him and he was getting a little fidgety um, and seemed nervous. And I said, well, Lewis, what's, what's the matter? What's going on? And he said, well, Rachel, this is my first anti-gay event. And then I realized that the experience that I had had of the United Methodist Church, where it was my family and where it was a place that I knew that I belonged, was not the experience that Lewis carried based on his experience at annual conference. And so that was the moment when I knew that not only was I called to be a woman of integrity in my own personal life and in my job, but also that I'm called to be a person of integrity in our church. And the next year at annual conference, the bishop allowed Lewis to cross that imaginary line and to go up and to share his story. 
And this year, at the end of April, the United Methodist Church will invite me to cross that imaginary line when I'm commissioned as a deaconess. And I'll be commissioned as a deaconess to work for the Reconciling Ministries Network, and I'm really excited about it. But I'm also excited about the work that we're doing together. And so I hope that you will also cross the imaginary lines, both in our society, by sharing your story. So you can share it through a video, or you can write it down on paper, or send us an email, and the office will take it in whatever form it presents itself. And I also hope that you'll cross the imaginary line at annual, at annual conference this year. And I hope that when you step up to the mic, that you will reframe the conversation to be one about inclusion. And that you will do that not only for yourself, but also for people like Lewis and myself who are not yet allowed to cross the line. 